Hi, welcome to another exciting and interesting episode of Digging for Truth. Today I'll be joined in the studio with my co-host Scott Lancer and archaeologist Gary Byers, assistant co-director of the Shiloh Excavations. We'll be talking about the exciting discoveries we found this year in 2018 at Biblical Shiloh. We hope you enjoy this really cool and fun episode. Well, guys, we want to talk about Shiloh 2018. And we had a, well, we had a phenomenal uh, dig season last year. We want to talk about all things Shiloh today. So let's jump right in on that. And so, Gary, uh, maybe you could introduce us to why it's important there, why we dig there, and just kind of jump right into the subject. Well, uh, ABR, the Associates for Biblical Research, has been uh, doing archaeological work in the Holy Land and basically in the West Bank area, in the mountains, those central mountains, uh, for four, over 40 years. And uh, we've been looking for the, the, the evidence of the biblical cities. And we spent most of our time at Kirbet Nisia and uh, Kirbet El Makader. And those two, those two sites uh, where, where we think, where we looked for the ancient city of Ai. And, we mm -hmm. think maybe we found I at Kirbet El Makader. So um, uh, that's, that was really important to us. Mm -hmm. And then we were invited to go up, up the, the mountains uh, to the north, about another 10 miles past uh, Makader, to, to Shiloh. Shiloh, the mm -hmm. story of, of, of Eli and, uh, and Hannah and Samuel, Shiloh. Get to dig at Shiloh. And the Are tabernacle. you kidding me? And the, the Ark of the Covenant. Man. No, we didn't find the Ark of the Covenant. No, no, yeah, <laughs> but it was there. It was there. <laughs> and uh, it was there. And so when, when that opportunity came up, um, and we really were at the place where we were ready to close down at, at McCotter, and So it really was just a wonderful opportunity uh, to go there and work. And we worked directly uh, with the Israeli uh, 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 archaeologists. Uh, Department of Antiquities is in Jordan, <laughs> where, I, where I, the other dig, where we'll talk about in a while. But uh, at the Antiquities Authority, we yeah. work directly with them, closely mm -hmm. with them on mm -hmm. the site. And it's been really a wonderful opportunity to, um, to deal with um, another site that went to the time of the Book of Judges, the Book of Joshua. It's the same kind of stuff, mm -hmm. demonstrating the historical reliability of, of Scripture from mm -hmm. the ground in archaeology. So we were really excited, and of course, uh, we've done our first two seasons now. Yes, now, uh, Dr. Scott Stripling is the director of the dig, and Gary, you're the assistant co-director, and so uh, you, you have some important duties in this, in this whole thing. What, what, do you, what do you do as an assistant co-director? Well, and, and, and that kind of thing I've, I've been very privileged to do, and since you, since you brought it up, <laughs> I know so many archaeologists that are more qualified than I am to do what I do. And so why does God give me the chance to do some of this cool stuff? And the best I can come up with is Psalm 37, 4, you delight yourself in the Lord and he gives you the desires, desires of, of your heart. heart. Yeah. You know, I am not the best, I'm not the most worthy, but I've been given this privilege and I am so grateful and I want to do the absolute bestest I can because this is a wonderful privilege to be given this opportunity. Yeah. So mm -hmm. from, from my role, sometimes I, I'm supervising a square and, mm -hmm. and leading a particular five by five meter square like all the other squares. Other times I'm uh, walking around supervising what goes on in other squares, helping mm -hmm. the square supervisor with things they're concerned about, jumping in and just helping do things. And then not just what's going on in the square, but then all the things we're finding, the finds on the field, out in the field where we're working with them, as well as once we get back to the uh, headquarters and deal with the stuff later. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, it's, um, it's a, a wonderful privilege and a labor of love to work with some wonderful people that we've yes. got on our dig teams, yes. talented, yeah. capable people, and uh, to, to, f to be finding the coolest stuff in the world, yes. and I get to do it yeah. at Shiloh. That's pretty awesome. And we should mention, Henry is the dig administrator, 
And, uh, you know, it, it's a team effort, though, isn't it? Yes, it's, it sure uh, it's is. Everyone yeah. out in the field. It's those back here, at, well, back here, but we're, we're here in Pennsylvania. Our offices are here in Pennsylvania, and we have a wonderful office staff and all yeah. of us working yeah. together to make this dig yeah. a success. So yeah. it's a really, really awesome thing. Um, we could mention a lot of people on our team, though. I, we should always mention Dr. Bryant Wood. Yeah. He's the head of research. Uh, we mentioned Scott as the dig director. Maybe we could talk, just mention a couple of the other staff members and give them a shout out here today. Yeah, well, we have, uh, we have professors from 11 different universities and some even more than one from, from those different universities that support us. And um, uh, I, I, I think of particularly uh, uh, Professor Boyd Seavers from Northwestern in, in, in Minnesota. And uh, he and I've worked closely together on stuff from McCotter as well as there at Shiloh. His, last year, his square was next to mine. And so he... Uh, he had to work next to you? He, it, was a, oh, it was a labor God. of love on his part. <laughs> and then uh, Dr. Mark Hassler uh, from, I can't think, the Virginia school Beach. in Virginia Beach. Yeah. And, uh, and he's just done a, a lot of work. And, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Brian Peterson from Lee University yes. brings a boatload of students every year. Oh, yes. And it's just a really exciting group of, of capable uh, people who love God who do good archaeology and uh, do the research and the publication afterwards. It's really important. We have a wonderful, uh, wonderful dig team. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. always room for more. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. This last yeah. year, uh, about 200 different people were on our dig team, which made us, for two years in a row, just about the largest dig in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, they came from 30 different states of, 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 of our 50 and um, from uh, four different countries. And uh, we just had a, a great group of people, but there's always room for more. That's right. And so if somebody out there wants to join us, we'd love for him to talk to the administrative director. That's, that's he me. He will sign you up. I will sign you up. So folks watching yeah. the show, we, we can say that you can yeah. join us. Absolutely. And you can come and... and and dig in the ground in Israel, mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, be part of a particular discovery. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Thank you for watching Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. We've been talking about the exciting discoveries at Biblical Shiloh. You must be wondering, could I go to Israel and dig in the land? And the answer is yes. We'd love for you to visit our website, digshiloh.org, to find out more. And now we hope you enjoy segment two of this episode about Biblical Shiloh. We're going to talk, to, talk about discoveries from 2018. Uh, why don't you start with... The Egyptian scarabs that we found. Okay. They're really cool and people just love hearing about Egypt. So have at it. So um, scarab is the Latin word for beetle. beetle. A beetle. I think it's French, isn't it? Uh, well, the French got it from the Latin. Oh, see, I didn't know that. <laughs> see, I should never correct the archaeologist. Stay, stay tuned. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so a scarab is, is a beetle. beetle. And, um, and so what the ancient Egyptians did, they revered the beetle. In fact, it's called a dung beetle. Um, beetles that would actually um, uh, come out of, uh, out of dung and roll little balls of dirt and dung around. And I, I've actually seen them do it in the desert. I've seen beetles roll these little balls of stuff in the desert. And the Egyptians were fascinated with it. And they kind of got the idea that it was um, like that there's a great big beetle in the sky rolling the sun across the uh, the sky and so uh, they, they had this this idea that these guys were, were kind of sacred and special mm -hmm. so they would make their seals um, uh, 
uh, kings, uh, important people had a seal, and and they would make their seals uh, out of out of stone, and the uh, the bottom of of the seal, the bottom would be flat, and they would have carved in there whatever they wanted. And the Egyptians, uh, if it was a pharaoh, had had his cartouche and whatever your symbols uh, were, mm-hmm. whatever message you wanted to represent you. And then the top, they would always make it look like one of these beetles. Beetle, yeah. And so yeah. we began to call these when they were found. They were just we referred to them as, as scarabs, and um, uh, your, your seal was on the bottom. And so you would, you would. Uh, in, in, now at Robin Hood's day, the seal in Robin Hood's day, they took wet, they took wax, mm. hot wax, and they would dip it in that. In the Bible world, they weren't using hot wax. Didn't know to do that. But what they were using was wet clay. So you'd take a, roll up a scroll, uh, 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 put this wet clay, dab of wet clay right where you wanted it, seal it with your, with your seal, with your scarab, and then that would seal the document. And woe be under the person that broke that, that seal, broke the seal before yeah. they, they should. Yeah. And so they would seal all kinds of, uh, uh, identify all kinds of things with, with their seal. So these seals... Um, you can, we're able to, based on the symbolism on the, on the seal side, you can put them in the time periods. Sometimes as a pharaoh, a cartu- a pharaoh's cartouche, then you know who the pharaoh was and right. you know that mm-hmm. time period. But others, there's just certain um, uh, symbols that were used over and over again during certain periods. And so our, our seals were all Egyptian seals. Um, all of them from... Um, well, we had we had I, we had one from Tutmosis the Third, who maybe is the Pharaoh of the Exodus or not, mm-hmm. and and so these could have been in the in the Holy Land at the time of that person. Certainly wouldn't have been before, but at the time or after. Yes. And maybe it was carried by somebody, an official person representing mm-hmm. the Pharaoh, or maybe somebody found it and it was you know it was just a, an heirloom that you held on to. But we had six of these. A bunch of them found right in the ground. You recognized it as you're finding them. And others were found as we sifted the dirt afterwards. And, of course, we have two sifts, a, a, a dry sift, but you can't always see it because it's caked in mud. And then mm-hmm. we have this really special thing called a wet sift where when you, when you uh, wash all the mud off, the stuff you can find, mm-hmm. coins mm-hmm. and seals. And over the years, archaeologists... Who have most have not been able to wet sift. They've probably thrown a lot of stuff away and not known it. So we have the benefit of of using the wet, the water, to discover things that would have been lost. And at Kirbet El Makater, there was no water. Yeah, to we do couldn't. Such we couldn't thing. do it there. Yeah. Yeah. Being at Shiloh, uh, with the the, um, uh, the the kibbutz right there, the, the we have the ability to have water, and we've taken advantage of it, and we are finding things that that we never would have found in our. We didn't find. We did not find in our dry sift, but we sent it down there, and lo and yeah. behold, and it has just been wonderful. And part of that was, now the, the scarab is, is, is the seal itself, but the seal impression on the clay, we found one of those in that wet sift. Mm-hmm. And so for the first time, we not only have seals, we didn't have that seal, with that, that particular seal, we didn't have that seal, but we've got... We found an impression. We've got the impression of another scarab that would have been. It was, yeah. it was really spectacular. Cool. Yeah, and, and these scarabs are, can be used for dating, right? And that's part of the value of them, right? Yes, we, absolutely. I, it may be relative dating to, to some extent, yes. but, but it, they're important. Absolutely. So when people hear that, it's, it's not that we just found something that looks cool Absolutely. and it has artistic features to it. Although that's all true, too. It's, that's Yeah, that's <laughs> all. People love all that. But yeah, the dating they also help important. us with the dating. Yeah. And it, that, that all fits in well with our, our work there at Shiloh. And that's the part the archaeologists love because it really right. helps them date what's going on. Yes, yes. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org.
Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. In a previous segment, and in this episode today, we've been talking about exciting discoveries from Biblical Shiloh. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion so far with Gary Byers and my co-host, Scott Lancer. We'll be picking up more of our conversation in this next segment. Stay with us, and we hope you enjoy it. Well, I guess another uh, important find, probably the most important find thus far, was the ceramic pomegranate. And so maybe we should talk about uh, that today, uh, because that really uh, stands out among all the other discoveries so far, I think. Yes, yes. It it really, it, it has fueled the imagination of people all over the world who are hearing about this. They, they know the story of Shiloh and the tabernacle and, and Eli the priest and Samuel the priest. And when they hear of a, of a ceramic pomegranate, now maybe they don't think about it at first, but once they hear about it and realize what it was, boy, does that fire everybody's imagination. So mm-hmm. um, uh, on the priestly garment around the high priest special garment uh, that he wore just for special occasions, uh, there were linen pomegranates and, and bells around the bottom of his garment. And now these pomegranates were made of, of linen. Uh, mm-hmm. Don't know how big they were, but uh, about the size of, of our ceramic pomegranate, probably. Mm-hmm. And so um, they were also uh, uh, symbols that were used in the temple. And so they, they were well known and used, understood to be associated with the Israelite religious activities. Mm-hmm. And, and mentioned in the Bible frequently. And so when you find a, a ceramic pomegranate at Shiloh, it just fuels your, your imagination. Well, the Bible said it was the tabernacle was at Shiloh, and now you've got a ceramic pomegranate. That's just evidence that that's what was going on there. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then it helps you to think, maybe we could find the site of the tabernacle. Yeah. It, we're, uh, I can't remember this, so Gary, so, so correct me. Were, were pomegranates also uh, attached to the the um, cloth of the tabernacle or only the priestly garments? Yeah, priestly garments and then the temple. The structure. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the structure. temple structure, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, but not mm-hmm. the tabernacle. Not the tabernacle, okay. So so these, this pomegranate uh, is, is a fruit. The pomegranate's yes. a fruit. Um, and so we find this uh, in the ground. We read in the biblical text the importance of the pomegranate. Description, I think, in Exodus, actually, right? Yeah. Exodus 21 yeah, and, or 22, yeah, yeah. right? And else, that, yeah, and elsewhere, yes. And elsewhere. So, I mean, the buzz that this created on the site this year was, was quite extraordinary. And in the program here, we'll show the picture of the pomegranate. We're allowed to show it now. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, boss yeah. has given us permission to show it, so our audience will be able to see it. Um, so, you know, just talk about that a little bit more, because I can remember the sort of the buzz going on. That's what happens at the digs. Everybody gets really excited about it. Well, you know, we, we, we dug it. Kirbet El Makata and Kirbet Nisia for years and uh, found some really cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. But people didn't get that excited about Kirbet El Makata or Kirbet Nisia. But you talk about Shiloh and their ears already are perked up. Yeah. And then you find something related to the tabernacle, the high priest at Shiloh. And it was, it, it, uh, it, it just, everybody was so excited. On our team, every guest and visitor that came in, scholars and just regular old people, Boy, did they take notice when we when we talked about that. Yeah. Any little hint that got out there, other people really took it and ran with it. And some kind and sometimes in places we didn't think they should be going. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As, yeah. Uh, yeah. Making connections that we didn't want to make. But yeah. it was it's been it's been a wonderful find and just fuels us for this coming season. So these people that are sitting out here listening, they really ought to come and help us find the next pomegranate and yeah. who knows what else. And you, know, you never know. You never know what you're going to find. It, it might just quickly, it might be good just to connect for people that they're going to say, well, what was this thing used for? Well, in, in centers of, we call it a cultic center, yes, cult. you might enter a room where there might be a, maybe a tree of life or something like that, where you might hang these pomegranates there. Maybe we'll discover some other uh, parts of the the whole thing that that is connected with yes. this pomegranate. Yes. yes, could be an incense altar or or just all kind all kinds of things that it could have been related to. It 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 has a little hook thing at the top. It That's looks right. like that you can hang from. And it turns out that when we went back and looked at some of the earlier excavations, uh, there was actually a part of one found earlier, 
and they had no idea what it was because they didn't have as much as we had. They couldn't see the whole image. But so there's actually an earlier one, and we've actually got some pictures of it from uh, where it was found, um, uh, from the from the from the records, and even mm-hmm. went to the museum and saw it over there. Where that was from the 1920s. Kept. They thought yes. it was a different object. Yeah. And we went back and found it as part of archaeology, is what we call museum archaeology, or yeah. or doing research is yes. a big component of what what yeah. we have to do. And so, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very, it's very exciting. It's clearly, clearly uh, connected in some way to the, we don't know exactly, but the fact that this was a worship center, animal mm-hmm. sacrifice, cult, what we call cultic, uh, just, just an extraordinary find that fits, obviously, the context, right place, right time, as you always yeah. say. Yeah, and we're trying to help uh, our, our audience watching today. We want them to connect the fact that we are finding these awesome things that show them, hey, this is, this is an affirmation of what we read in the Bible. Uh, and, of course, we have detractors who say, well, those, these accounts never happened. These things never occurred. And we're saying, no, there's some good evidence here on the ground that supports yeah. the Bible. And, and we want people to have confidence in the Word. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the glossy. And uh, now people don't use the word glossy in daily speech, so maybe it's we French, should. Do- Henry. <laughs> yeah. I know it's French, yeah, I got that one right. <laughs> it is indeed. But a glossy, we find them in various, uh, we find them at one in Jericho, you find them in these important sites in Israel, but we found it also, a really extraordinary one at Shiloh, but we better let everybody know what, what it is. Yeah, what is that, Gary? All right, well, uh, you, 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 you build a city up on a, on a hill. Uh, you want it to be a, on a hill for defensive purposes, but you, of course you want it on a hill somewhere close to water, so you can't get too high up on a hill, but high enough. And then as part of the, your defensive system, uh, you build a, a wall up there around the top of the city, and then you would, you would build a glossy, an earthen rampart at, at, a, at an angle, which would be very difficult for a soldier to climb up, uh, and there's, there's nothing there except him trying to get up this glossy, and ours is at a 35-degree angle. It's about, um, about uh, 30 or 40 feet high from, from, from the bedrock level up to where we found the, from the bottom to the top, the whole thing. Yeah, intact, which it, is extraordinary. It, it was amazing. Yeah. Right next to you. Yep. You, you got credit for part of it. Yeah, just a little bit uh, in my bit, square, yep, but not, mu- not much. The next square uh, over, Dr. They got, Peterson. They, yeah. they got most all of it. Yep. And so, so we got this whole thing. So it was, a, it, was, it was a part of the defensive system, rampart, earthen rampart up and the wall on top of that. And there may well have been another smaller wall down below to help hold it in and, and, and keep it from being uh, undermined. Mm-hmm. And so it was an amazing, uh, an incredible, an incredible amount of work all the way around this site. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, this was probably around. It has been found in other places by earlier excavations. We were the first ones to find like, like we found it. So the yeah. material that it's made of, it's not made of stone. Dirt. So it's dirt, but it's su- like, would you say super packed? Would yes, that be the and, way to describe and really it? really a lot of clay. A lot, a lot of clay, clay, right. In fact, sometimes they're, they're made with, with the clay from mud bricks or even sort of made with mud bricks. So, mm-hmm. and, and uh, we call, one of the terms we use in archaeology uh, is parallels. So we look at other sites, other fortification structures. Talk about Jericho a little bit and connect it with Shiloh. Yes, Jericho had... Uh, um, the same kind of thing had a, a lower outer wall and then earthen rampart up and uh, and and uh, then an upper inner wall and so we we probably had something similar to that uh, at Jericho the outer wall was was pretty massive impressive and uh, yeah. archaeologists have uncovered that and and mud bricks from the houses and glossy and stuff that fell over and Looks like the Israelite army, just like the Bible says, every man went straight up into the city, climbing up this debris when the wall fell down, climbing up this debris uh, into the, up into the city. And, and it's amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, God, God used all of that uh, to do a great work, used a glossy and other stuff yes. to help yeah. do a great work. Maybe in the time we have remaining, wh- why don't we talk about why people should go to Shiloh? You know, why should people sign up? Why should they go? Why is this important? Well, the, uh, the site is really, really an attractive place. Yeah. They've got a, a beautiful visitor center. They've, they've, got, they've done a, made a, a wonderful place. 
there's a, there's a snack bar uh, with, <laughs> with great stuff that we always stop and get ice after cream. the day, every day after the dig. Come to Israel, have ice cream. Yeah, that's right, and good ice cream. <laughs> and so it's, it's set up really nice. They, they really take tourists well. Uh, and, that, and then because it's connected to the, to the, um, to the community right there, we have, we have accesses to resources that are wonderful, like the water, mm -hmm. uh, like we put up our tents and we can leave them up um, as opposed to, to slipping our stuff up and down the hill from every other site I've ever been to. Yeah. You can leave it all up because it's fenced and guarded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, it's, a, it's a, just a wonderful setup. Most of the time we have either porta potties or you go behind a bush <laughs> uh, at most sites, and here at Shiloh, we got real bathrooms. We do. Real bathroom. Awesome. Real bathroom. So if you want to come to Israel, you get to have a real bathroom, but you really get to experience the experience of digging at Shiloh in the Holy Land. We hope people yeah. that are watching will be willing to come and join us. Absolutely. Amen. We're so grateful that you joined us in our discussion today about biblical Shiloh and the excavations conducted there sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. We hope that you've been edified and lifted up by these powerful evidences that show the reliability of the biblical accounts. And we hope that you'll come to know the one who gave this word to us, the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Thank you for joining us.